The Astronomy of the Bhagavad Purana, Part 3 of 3. So, if you haven't seen Parts 1 and 2 yet, please do so. Otherwise, you won't be able to appreciate this final section of this presentation. But let's have a look at the summary of Part 1. We were saying in the fifth canto of the Bhagavatam, four models were connected to the Earth and the island of Jambadweep. They were links between the Earth and heavenly realms, those huge heavenly realms, the Earth plane, and a center pivot of our solar system. A summary of part two, we were looking down, of course, on the plane of Bumandala here, that flat disk, looking at the outer rings and corresponding those with the geocentric orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, and so forth. We're also looking at the Bumandala slightly more from the side, looking at the various planetary heights above the plane of Bumandala, not relating that to physical travel, but rather a vertical dimension. That leads us on to chapter 23, the Shishamara planetary systems. So imagine we're on the Earth there, looking up along that red line, and looking up towards the pole star. Of course, all visible bodies circle around the pole star from Earth's point of view. And there you go, perhaps any given night we'll be able to see many, many stars. Here's just a few representing many, many more. However, at present the Earth is not completely perpendicular to Bumandala. It is tipped a little. That would place a pole star more like, perhaps, more like there. Of course, uh, we understand over a long, long period of time, over 26,000 years, there's a full cycle where the pole stars change over that period of time. So at the moment, perhaps it's polaris, but uh, about 14,000 years ago, it could have been Vega. And when the Bhagavatam was spoken about 3000 BC, they reckon it was Thurban. However, Druvaloka, which is, of course, also called the pole star, could that indeed be a subtle planet where, no matter which way the uh, Earth is leaning, it's actually still there as the pole star? We don't know. But imagine now, strictly from Earth's point of view here, we're looking up, uh, here's uh, some stars to represent um, some of the stars you'd see at night, and it would go around, of course, like this. It was almost like an umbrella over the Earth. Now then, this is the Shishamara Dolphin Constellation, and it was most visible around 790 BC to 1000 AD, so say some experts. But this is very interesting and a point of meditation, uh, seen as a manifestation of the Lord himself. Chapter 17 the descent of the Ganges, the river Ganges. Here we can just see the dwarf incarnation of Lord Vishnu piercing the top of the universe, letting in the sacred Ganges water. Let's see how that flows. We must remind ourselves from section two of this presentation, the side view here of the solar system and some stars and of course Druvaloka or the pole star at the top there. This is important to remind ourselves of this because this is the descent of the river Ganges now. First of all, goes past Druvaloka there, or the Pole Star, past the Big Dipper, or the Seven Stages, depending on what you want to call it. It reaches the moon in a number of celestial airplanes and aircraft, but then from the moon itself, this sacred river Ganges, this subtle form of the river Ganges at least, goes from the moon and lands on Mount Meru. So let's have a look at that. It comes all the way down to the top of Mount Meru, as illustrated here. Closing in, we can see the top of Mount Meru here, and there's various demigods um, residing over the various directions of Vayu, Yamaraj, Sama, and so forth. But in the centre is a holiday resort, a city uh, owned by Lord Brahma. And the Ganges comes through in the middle of that city, then goes off in four directions. One of them, of course, comes down the... Well, they all come down the side of Mount Smero here, and they land on top of Lord Shiva's head. Of course, he protects that. This is, of course, a subtle or a spiritual form of the Ganges coming down, which we won't be able to see, but Lord Shiva stops it from destroying the earth. And, of course, we know that it becomes the um, form of the Ganges we know today, where people in India, especially, they come and bathe to cleanse their sins. Chapter 22. The Orbits of the Planets, Part 2. The Vertical Dimension. Again, reminding ourselves here of the side view of the solar system and some nearby stars. It's actually Bavarloka area here. We can go much, much further up now to right to the top of the universe. So, just to get an idea of scale, the Earth is about here from our previous diagrams, and the pole star about here. So we go much further up now, just that black line at the top there, and we can see all these various different heavenly planets far beyond the pole star. Adding in there the Loka Loka mountain there, so therefore we can't see past that, nor can we see underneath the plane of Bumandala, as illustrated here. And of course the sun's rays enable us to actually see all these stars as well. Looking now at the, the, uh, the, this, this 
Bromandala, this uh, universe, this inner universe actually. And you can see in the bottom half is the Garbed Acker Ocean. This was described in part two of this presentation. But now we're concentrating on all these heavenly planets and stars we can see in the top half of the universe. Yes, 400,000 different humanoid species are occupying there, including humans and demigods too. Looking at the various heavenly planets on different levels, as described in the Bhagavad Gita, Druva Loka, or the Pole Star, Maha Loka, Jana Loka, Tapa Loka, and finally at the top there, Satya Loka. And after that, after Satya Loka, we get the beginnings of the subtle coverings of the universe, which we'll get into later. First of all, let's go on a bit of a space journey. We're going to start off with Maha Loka, see what's there. Then go up to Jana Loka, Tapa Loka, and Satya Loka. Mahaloka, a great place, great rishis and sages end up there. Wonderful heavenly planet. Janaloka, and indeed Tapaloka, a place of great aesthetics and celibates. And those yogis wanting to meditate in peace and quiet go to these planets. Tapaloka, incidentally, is the origin of the four Kamaras, or where you'll find the four Kamaras there. Satyaloka at the top there, of course, the abode of Lord Brahma. People there live in great bliss for many, many trillions of years, and if they're still there by the end of the universe, they'll be liberated if they live a devotional life. Chapter 24. The Subterranean Planets. First of all, let's go back to Rahu, who was mentioned in the part two. It is indeed a lower planet, but it's higher than it should be. We can see it, at least, when there's a solar eclipse. This is because when Mohini Murti chopped off the demon Rahu's head, he'd already had some nectar to drink which made him immortal, or at least it made his head immortal, and that is the Ra inauspicious Rahu planet in Vedic culture. Of course, a slightly more mundane look way of looking at it, which has satisfied the scientists, of course, is what we're looking at here is a solar eclipse, where the moon is blocking the rays of the sun to some part there of the earth. But the big difference between the Vedic conception is that Rahu is given an identity, it's a planet in itself, separate from that of the moon. For, from the point of view of the celestial beings, the moon is actually a heavenly planet, whereas Rahu is a hellish and dark one. The Bhagavatam describes, of course, about 800,000 miles below Rahu, uh, 800,000 miles nearer to the Earth, is Siddhaloka, Chanamaloka, and Vijaraloka. These are planets and all realms of angels. And just about 800 miles above the surface of the Earth, Yakshas, Rakshashas, and ghosts are found. So I wouldn't go around there too much. Now, let's open up the Earth and see what's underneath. We can see there's various type of subterranean realms and caverns in the Earth here. And it's understood that somehow or other one can access the lower planetary systems through this way. Atala Loka, Vitala Loka, Sutala, and so on and so forth. Looking here again, a close up of the side here of the planetary system, the, the, the solar system, and so forth. As mentioned, the lower planets occupy the realm between the Garbhadaka Ocean and Bumandalu itself. And here we have Atalaloka. This is a place where uh, very beautiful prostitutes actually lure men into making them think they're very powerful and sexually potent, but ultimately they are accountable for their karma and they will have to die at the end. Vitala, a place where gods or semi-demigods and asuras, demonic beings actually live in great opulence, surrounded by gold and marvellous palaces. Sotala is a place of Bali Maharaj. Now Bali Maharaj, although of Asuric descent, ended up being a great devotee who actually gave away the universe, uh, the control of the universe, and he was given, well, as a consolation prize, he got a lower planetary system back, but it's a very nice place to be. Tala Tala. This is the abode of Maya Danava, the greatest demoniac architect in the universe. All kinds of flying machines and great celestial buildings there where people do not know disease, as we understand it, but still they have to die, in th and yet it is an atheistic place, dominated by science. Mahatala, of course, is a, a here, according to the picture, is a place of great demoniac multi-headed serpents. I wouldn't fancy going there. Rasatala, a dark place, enemies of the demigods, where people live in rats like holes, hiding from the celestial beings for their sinful activities. And finally, at the top here, we have Patala Loka. This is the Nagas. The abode of the Nagas are snake-like beings with jaws in their foreheads who can shape-shift and all kinds of things. Again, not a kind of a place to hang out. Chapter 25, The Glories of Lord Ananta. It's understood that 
between uh, the um, the bottom of the top sorry of the Garbodaka Ocean, we have this many many multi founders and headed snake who's basically holding all the planetary systems on his heads there. He's worshipped by Lord Shiva, the deity of Tamagoon or darkness. Therefore, Ananta is sometimes called Tomasi. But who is the origin of Lord Ananta? Who is he an expansion of? And that is Lord Balaram. So he's a very, although, although he has a difficult role and of course becomes very angry and destroys the universe at the end of the universe's time, still, ultimately, it is Lord Balaram and the arrangement of the Lord. A Lord Ananta's power appears similar to what scientists call gravity, holding up the planets there in their orbits. Yet it is Pravaha, a subtle cosmic wind, which causes the planets and stars to move. In the second canto, a purport of the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada writes, The floating of the planets in the weightless air is due to the inner constitution of the globes. Chapter 26, The Hellish Planets. Of course, going back to a Lord Ananta here, and we can see that just above, actually, even below the lower planets, just above the surface of the Garbodaka Ocean, are the wonderful hellish planets, and there are many of them, unfortunately. Where are they on this map here? Well, just below the lower planets is the hellish realm there, just skirting on the edge of existence and habitation. Yamaloka, of course, a presiding deity of punishment and judgment, is Yamaraj, who resides within this region. Uh, people, sinful people, who pass away, are brought down to this planet for judgment in their astral bodies and of course they get the punishment to fit the crimes and I'm afraid it's not the top of the list for places to go on holiday either especially if you've been particularly sinful however it's not forever and it's not for eternity but um, everyone is due for their karma according to the Vedic culture and therefore a great incentive to behave ourselves but let's have a look at some some of those hellish planets as Kala Sutra a place of course made of copper where you cannot keep your feet still it's constantly hot not a very nice place there's can be Bojana, a place where this a lake, huge lake full of worms are practically eating each other. By Tarani River, a place, a river that people are thrown by demons into there, a place full of blood and mucus and all kinds of horrible substances. Of course, th we have to look a little bit at relative time because huge periods of time are connected to time in the hell. However, let's get some relief from this. Five minutes in heaven according to relative time, is maybe about five years on Earth. Therefore, going down in the same direction, 10,000 years in hell. So, it is described that, that some people are thrown into hell for 10,000 years, but how much of that time is actually experienced on Earth? We'll have to see. Additional information here. Size and coverings of this Brahmandala universe. So again, reminding ourselves of what we were looking at earlier, this, this huge circular um, shape here of the inner uh, universe with the bottom half, the Garbodak Ocean, and above that being all the various stars and planets of different times. And there we have the Plain of Bumandala. Now, the x-axis here from one part to the other is about 4 billion physical miles. Of course, we said this corresponded with the solar system. However, the y-axis here, the vertical dimension, which is different, about 4 billion subtle miles as experienced by the demigods. So let's look at the coverings. So yes, we have that 4 billion miles of the solar system. But there are coverings, and let's have a look. So as we get further away or closer, as it was case may be, from outside, we get the densification of elements. And as we get away from the inner coverings of the universe, we're going backwards in time. So what are those coverings like? We have layers of earth, subtle earth, water, fire, air, ether. Do remember one thing, each covering is ten times thicker than the previous, after ether. Mind, intelligence, and on the outer layer of the universe, ego. So this, oh, looking at the whole thing now, including the covering of ego and all the other elements, it is like shaped like a golden egg there. But what about the size? What about the scale of this compared to, let's say, for example, what modern astronomers would uh, recognize? Well, let's say this Milky Way galaxy, according to modern estimations, would actually be roughly the same size, interestingly enough. What is beyond this Brahmandala universe? Well, many others. 
here's Mahavishnu here lying in the causal ocean in the in the great cosmos here and as he breathes in and out in and out all these millions of universes the um, Brahmandas rather coming out of the, in and out of the pores of his skin here the universe is actually one of the smaller ones and here just coming out of his foot there and this is uh, Durga, this, of course, manifestation of the material energy. And when Mahavishnu glances upon her, that glance includes all the conditioned souls, all the jivas uh, at the beginning of the universe and how we enter into there. And the personification of the glance is Lord Shiva. So let's go beyond this. There's something beyond the material universe. There you go. So in the bottom right corner here, we can see the whole cosmic manifestation there. But what's beyond that? is that bluish sky, that eternal place of Vaikuntha, full of millions of Vaikuntha planets, presided over by the Lord's Narayan forms. But the most significant planet of all, and the origin of all others, is Gloka Vandavan there, surrounded by a whitish light. But within that, we have Lord Krishna, Lord Titania, and all the original incarnations of the Lord, the origin of everything, a place of, full of eternal knowledge and bliss, and without anxiety. Let's have a look at a bit of that light. Well, there it is, nothing much there. Of course, this is called the Brahma Jyoti, the impersonal, of impersonal effulgence. So some people in some traditions will say that there's, beyond this world that the idea is to reach, reach Nirvana, a place of nothingness. But there's not a lot there. Even if it is a blissful place free from anxiety, still the tendency is to fall down from there because we desire to have experiences and relationships and experience form. So what's better than that? What's beyond that? The Vaikunth planets, let's home in on one of those. A place where many of the male forms, the male Vishnu forms, have four arms. Again, the, and the relationship that inhabitants have of this form of God is that of awe and of reverence, a great kingly place, a, gr a great place free from anxiety and opulence. But is there more? Is there more than this um, feeling of great awe and of reverence towards the Lord? And the answer is, yes, there is. So let's now go in the center of Goloka Vandavan itself. And here, the main deity of Goloka Vandavan, the original form of the Lord himself, that two-armed form of Lord Krishna, in this image here, surrounded by the gopis of Vandavan. This is the origin of all. This is the supreme reality. The original, blissful, all-attractive, supreme personality of Godhead and his devotees. And this is the aim of all devotees of Lord Krishna to enter into this abode, other places, even like Vaikuntha, what to speak of the Brahma Jyoti, are seen as being inferior to this, where one can have, in this place, a personal relationship with the Lord as a father, a brother, a son, or a lover. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, and please share it with others. Thank you. Hare Krishna.